but dad has an old junker and uh, rod goes through the block <laughs> and they, oh what do i do and of course he, he 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 wasn't walking with god at the time and so he didn't we didn't have any resources or benefits other than some of the grace that my mother acquired because she loved the Lord and she walked with him. And yeah, my dad gets down underneath and he drops the pan with the Crescent Ranch and finally gets that rod off of the main shaft and drives the piston back up into, and, and he, you know, telling my mom, Get some pans out of the trunk. <laughs> we got to save the oil. <laughs> he drains the oil and saves the oil. And, and he drives the piston back up into its cavity and disconnects the spark plug wire so it's not on the shaft anymore. So it doesn't bang and go through the other side of the engine. And then stuffs that hole full of newspaper and drove it another 300 miles. Does that sound like some of your marriages? Because <laughs> I, I I've, I've helped you, and I can't, uh, why don't we have this newspaper? Here? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> well, that may have happened a long time ago. It may have happened when we were trying to find our way to God. But can't we at least be honest with ourselves about the origins of what's within us and where we came from so that we can be honest with God of maybe coming to him and thinking about his model and asking him for his intervention. If we don't admit that, the, that we did it wrong, then how can he heal that? Instead, we bring to him these trashy covenants and slide it before him. or We don't even ask him to sign it. We just declare, well, God loves marriage. Well, if that be the case, and homosexuals are included in there, and you can't exclude them. Why? Because it's a covenant. It's a contract. It's a covenant. It's by law. You can't exclude them. Either that, or we have to redefine marriage to mean what it means. The covenant between God and two people that God, in his covenant with that person, says to that person, that person right there is the one I got for you, and I'm bringing you together. So we looked at Satan's model, the world's model. Two people come together because they decide to. I love you. Woo! You know, at the eyeballs and the guys swooning the girl and all that stuff. And I got a real fast car, babe. Like she could care less, you know. World's model is come together to fill their passions or in heat. No responsibility except for lust, and when that kind of runs out, then, ah, when old woman, you gained weight, I'm going to go find me a bikini blonde again. Or vice versa, man, you gained weight, and you have it. Another model of the world is to give their hearts. Oh, my goodness. Romance. They're in control and based upon <coughs> based upon their heart being given, they say, Oh, this is wonderful. You've gotta be God. I like you so much. You've gotta be God. God's a God of love, right? That's what the homosexuals say. You haven't read in Scripture where it gives us the definitions of what love is. It's none of the definitions of the romance that we use. Not one. Not one. The biggest problem is, Scripture says, keep your hearts, for out of it come all the issues of life. We're not supposed to be giving our hearts. Why? Because God is the one that's supposed to give those. And many of us made the mistake of giving our hearts, thinking we were in love, and found out there was something wrong and something exploded in our face. And it may have taken several years for the explosion to happen. But we were still calling it God because we maybe started going to church. And instead of examining the fact of, wait, wait a minute, there, there's, something, there's something wrong here. See, now, there are covenants of this world that we enter into with each other. But that's not a God covenant. There's covenants that we can enter into with him. I'm hoping I'm making you nervous because I want you to really examine your past 
and find out where you come from and find out what you believe and what got you in trouble. And it may lead to some things of discoveries that your marriage is not dedicated to the Lord even now. And if we're going to have changes, if we're going to get back to the original model, we have to see why it's not, how it's not, and get it in line with Him and come and fall on our faces and say, Dear God in heaven, we've got a contract down here. And we didn't sign up for what was going on in Eden. We didn't infer you at all. All we did was just go to church and say, because of our romance, because of our desire, it's got to be God. Well, we ought to beg for forgiveness. But God can redeem that if the two people want it redeemed. God can redeem that. But unless it's redeemed, we're still of the world. Unless it's redeemed, God looks and says, well, you got a contract with the world, I understand that. But when are you going to enter into a contract with me, the two of you together? Because i got things in my kingdom that you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Instead, most contracts of adhesion between husband and his wife is how can we build our, cabin, our little cabin together in this guy? How can we set ourselves up? How can we be more comfortable? How can we have more romance? How can we do all of the things that we do. The third, or the fourth, in the world's model is we have common goals. I have known several doctors in my life, and most of them are oriented towards the thought, well, i got to get a woman that uh, she'll take care of the house. She's dependable. We both have goals of the future. We're going to have kids when we get 35, not before then. She's got to be in agreement. It's a planned out thing for his purposes of safety to establish his own kingdom. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But that's not God's model. Again, that's man making decisions. You remember, that's where we failed in the garden. God said, don't eat of that tree. Don't take that download so that you make your own decisions of what's good and what's evil. Because when it comes to marriage and we see some girl or some guy, our tongue starts hanging out and we immediately start calling it good. And that's what Eve did in the garden. She called the tree good. And then ate of it. And her whole program was corrupted. And she couldn't make any decisions. And she got her husband to eat of it because he was in love with her and said, Here, hubby. Oh, you, okay. you, you want me? Oh, sure. And again, he died in the midst of that. And neither one of them could ever be a companion to the living God again. Chaos came on the earth. The first war was probably when they stepped out of the garden. You stupid woman, what did you eat the fruit for? Yeah, well, you fool, you took it too. And they, they were filled with evil. They were, they were people like us now. Instead, they didn't have the peace of God. They didn't have the vernacular of God. They didn't have the joy of God. They didn't have those things. Instead, they were filled with those things, knowing how to get the punchlines in and the jabs and the stabs. And, and it started outside the garden and turned into the mess that some of us have walked through and experienced and some of the torments we've been in and some of the torments that we've given. So how can we lie to ourselves about our so-called worldly covenants? If you got a covenant from Kmart, do you think we need to get God's name on it somehow? And you don't do that by just going down and saying, okay, I'll get married in the church, because that's the pseudo-world model. It's the Christian pseudo. You know what pseudo means? The false model. We come together in our contract doing things our way. We go to church and think God and we expect Him to approve our model. We expect Him. Why? Because in pseudo Christendom they say, oh, marriage is holy. It's all of God. It doesn't matter if you're Muslim, it doesn't matter if you're homosexual, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because the term marriage means God has approved it. No, the term marriage originally only applied to Adam and Eve in the garden. And the law has formed its own contracts. They're not God contracts. They're not God contracts. So the first thing we have to discover is what kind of contract do you have in your back pocket? What kind of contract do you want? 
Because you can see if you're in your own contract, things are going to continue the way they were and the way they are. The way they were and the way they are. They will continue, except not continue to get good. Nothing in this world continues to get good. Everything is cascading downward, right? Why? Because we have a real open enemy in the midst of this. We come as Christians, get married in the church, and then live as the world does. That's another scenario. That's not a God covenant either. For your own purposes, your own life, your own actions. As Christians, we choose what we want. What well, violates Scripture again? The Scripture says we're supposed to be close enough to God that whatever He brings together, no man can put asunder. What He brings together. Are you mad at me yet? <laughs> oh, God, what are we going to do? <laughs> God's holy marriage contract is when God brings a man and a woman together. It's his man. The man that knows him, walks with him, fellowships with him, walks in his garden to delight, filled with the Spirit, wanting to do and accomplish God's will here on this earth. If you have that in your heart, then he'll show you a specific person that he's put that within their heart to achieve that. That's called a holy union, something that's set aside that you and God enter into, and because you and God enter into something, now he takes, lays his hands upon that, and he brings it together, and he blesses it. Not much conflict. Why? Because the rules are not his, and the rules are not hers. The rules are God's. And when and before he makes covenant and contract, he expects us to obey him in all things. Instead of us running out with our rules, now we'll take over because you put your seal on something. Adam and Eve didn't do that. God still came each day and was in the midst of their marriage, and they walked with him together. They walked with him together. He was in the midst of the marriage. Everything that they did was as a result of him being in the midst of their marriage. Our chaos that we have within us, of wanting to dominate and wanting to rule, chaos that's in there, we don't give God to him control of our lives. And if you don't give control of your life to God, how can you ever expect him to straighten your maid out that has all the problems? <laughs> it's going to require you to give your life to God. Not say four words, Jesus, save me. Jesus expects to live in you all the days of your life, and he expects your body to be his body, that he wants to do things for his Father here on earth through your body, not the little frivolous social works that we kind of figure out and think that we, oh, I want to do that. I'd be a pleasure. I don't know if anything Jesus did that brought him pleasure. It cost him his time. It cost him his effort. It cost him his breath. It cost him his life. It cost him his business. It cost him his family. It cost him a wife he could have. It cost him children he could have. And it cost him his throne even to come down here and accomplish those things. When God brings man and woman together, it's in holy union. And it's for the purpose of fulfilling his great plan. I can tell you, most of us in this room came together not to fulfill his great plan, but our plan. And some of us didn't even know what that plan was. It was just, well, we'll wing it. <laughs> well, you're still winging it, and you still got problems. So unless we can be truthful with ourselves, now you don't have to come up to me and, Pastor, i got to be truthful. What you said is, is right. I know it's right because it's what... God says, and that's his description in, 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 in the Word, and we would not have difficulties in our marriages if we were abiding in his presence and in his fellowship. Now, here's the thing. If you're single and you're abiding in his presence and in his fellowship and you get married and someone else has a different view, or you give up that view because you're so in love with the young lady or with the guy, but you still love the Lord and we'll just go to church part-time and we'll go play and we'll go do our thing and all this stuff, then you're headed again for shipwreck. Why? Because there's flesh in there that's taken over, 
And you no longer have the purposes of building something in God. Instead, you have the purposes of, again, building something for yourself. I started this out. I stated most people don't like God's model because it causes us to be accountable and enter into some thinking of responsibility that we have to him. I would much rather enter into the responsibility and the accountability and have peace and his blessing instead of war, which is simpler. Fleshman says it's, it's simpler to rebel. Fleshman says, I don't want to give up my rights to my throne. You, you remember Jesus came as king. He's expecting to take the throne. So if you're seriously wanting to help change things in your relational functionality, it has to begin in relationship with God first. With God first. Because if you're unwilling to come under his rules and change your rules, you can never change anything between you and your spouse. You can never. You might as well give up and you might as well walk out. You know, the whole crowd. <laughs> You can't change it. Man's plan, we give our, some people, the ladies mostly, oh, I'm so in love with you. That's the heart, the suki in the Greek, the soul. I'm so in love with you. And so because she falls so in love, she gives her body. And because she gives her body, oh, okay, here I am. I guess we're, we're technically probably married since we did this, right? You know how many young girls I've heard say that? We, we must be married because we, we went and did the thing behind the bush. Again, us trying to sway what marriage is and get ourselves in some form of right standing. Now, here's the guy. He goes after the body first. Right? Then he goes after the suki, the heart. Then after the spirit. Come on, woman, you got to serve me now. God said. I know more rednecks down south that make slaves out of the women and saying, I'm supposed to be God's king in your life and you're a prophet and you're a priest, babe. Now get her lined up. I've seen more ladies shipwrecked with that type of mentality because the man had no intention of entering in under God's holy rules of conduct, nor any covenant with God. All he wanted was the body, then the soul, and then your spirit is now my slave. God's plan is we enter into the spirit with him and walk with him. And in the midst of walking with him, he'll put you to sleep. He will raise up the person that he has for you that is walking with him. Then, when he raises that person up and he certifies us the person, he will give you a date and a time. It's time you can give your heart. Until that day, the scripture gives you a command you're supposed to keep your heart for every issue in life that concerns the future and concerns the past comes out of the heart. And if you give your heart... Before God says, give your heart, you're headed for some problems. That's part of the problem with our marriages. We gave of our hearts, we gave of our bodies, we, gave, we, we did it backwards. And then we run to God, we run to the church, and we get married and sign a license and say, oh, it's all okay. But yet, all hell is happening in the house, and we wonder, why isn't working out? And so we finally, we put on our bucks and gloves and we find out how far the reach is and we stay just beyond that reach and find our safety zones. And in those safety zones comes loneliness. In those safety zones comes some of the things that occur that brings destruction to the heart. We're not supposed to be safety zones. One of the first things that man and woman did was hide from God and hide each other. Not He wasn't covering her, he was covering himself. What was within him was something that God didn't sanction. 
What was within her is something that God didn't sanction. Fortunately, we have Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit here on earth to help bring us back to life and do something about the mess that we're in. Scripture gives us a command in Proverbs 5 and 15 and 19, drink water from your own cistern, running water of your own well. Oh, stop right there. My dad went down to my Uncle Bunch's place down there in East Texas and helped him dig a well, and it was about four foot across, and it was hand-laid brick, and they'd lay a layer of brick and then dig down more in a layer of brick, and they got down about 35, 40 feet and into a gravel zone, and water flooded in. It was nice and clear. Let it stand and clear out. And the next day, they you know, sent buckets down in there and built a little house over it and started dishing out the water and drinking the water and... Everybody had Montezuma's revenge. Water had something in it. Does your water have something in it? Because it says you're supposed to drink from your own wells, and many couples I meet stop even drinking because the water's bitter, the water's poison, the water done something to the inside. And so again, we have to back up and say, what's wrong with the water? And you realize that was one of the first miracles that Moses did. He came to bitter water. What did he put in it? A stick. A tree. First thing we can do and the only thing we can do is come to him and recognize the bitter waters that are within us, the bitter waters that we're giving, and the bitter waters that we're drinking. And ask God to modify our plan and to come into his plan because if we get his cross in the midst of our bitter waters and we honestly fess up to the positional relationship that we have with him and our contractual privileges called marriage, and not try to force down his throat the contractual marriage license of America or Mexico or Canada or wherever you happen to get your certificate from. Your certificate is supposed to be because God brought it together, not because you went to some wimp church that somebody would sign anything and call it marriage and say, oh, that must be holy before God. Now, I doubt if any of you have ever heard this concept. But if you don't understand the concept and you don't change the concept and you don't realize where you're at, you can never fix the rod that's through the block. It's easy to fix the rod that goes through the block. And it's by us not loving each other, but us turning to God and saying, God, I was in hate when I married this girl or that guy. And we were just out there under every bush and we just kind of tripped in and fell in and found you. And then we wanted to call our marriage and say it was of you. Oh, God, forgive us. But we want to change that. Oh, God, I want to become your son. I want to become your daughter. I want to enter into covenant with you. I want to learn your rules. I want to live by your rules. I want to learn what it was like in the garden. I want to become like Adam, and I want to become like Eve. If you're willing to make those kind of commitments to him, then you go to him, both of you on bended knee, and in prayer, God can come in and re-sanctify something and resurrect something that has no standing in his presence and has no blessing in his presence. I want to get to the point I strive to get to the point that God's blessing is upon our house. That His presence would just sweep through. Now, you've been to some of my house in the basement. Was God's presence there? Did His wind sweep through our house? Was there peace there? Was there something there? Because some of you said, well, now, when we come down to church, when we first started coming, I, I don't feel it like, it like I felt it there, but you do now. Many of you feel His presence come. So it's going to take some self-examination and realization, and you don't have to tell me about all the heartaches that you went through. I could give you a bunch of those. What we need to recognize is do we have a valid contract before God? And it's not valid if you just got some man to sign it. It's not valid if you were born in heat or lust or, or your own desires or your own purposes for the future. It's your contract. And there's the problem. We need to change that contract and get into a new contract with God. There's... Thus, we're having this study to find out what it was like between God and Adam and Eve. And then to come in and look at Scripture and let the Spirit breathe upon us. And, and if we can just really be truthful with ourselves about the position 
that we've come from. We take our contracts and throw them away and say, Lord, I need to come to you. Because I didn't hear your voice say, come together. I've had lots of heartaches and I've given lots of heartaches. But, oh God, I need you so desperately. We need you so desperately. And so part of this study is going to be you considering a prayer, you considering how you can get to that place of making a new covenant with God. Not a church covenant, a God covenant, a holy covenant of living for him and moving with him and having your being in him. And if the two of you want to get there, it's something that God can help you do. If you don't want to get there and you just want your rules and you want some sort of religious sanction, I can give you that. Even if you said that, well, hey, you're going the same way I am and we both go to the same church, it must be God. If you didn't get it certified that God brought something together, you're going to have some serious problems in your relationship in the future. When that happens and you start moaning, you start crying, your heart's ripped out and things aren't working out, it's because you didn't get the right covenant with God. God wants to teach us his ways. How can he do that if we won't accept his truth and his concepts? Are you in agreement with me that the world's definition of marriage is not God's covenant? Raise your hand if you're in agreement with me. Now, the big thing is, without raising your hand, how did we come into our marriages? Was it with that world contract? If it was, there's a remedy. So we have to admit where we stand in order to get the remedy. We have to find out where we are so we can get directions of how to get there into his presence and into his fellowship. I don't think it's going to be a, a hard course for you if that's your purpose and you finally want to do it God's way instead of your way. Matter of fact, those who choose that course end up with a delightful life. Many people approach Jackie and I and say, how do, how do you do it? Well, God brought us together. We're in his covenant. I'm responsible to him, and she's responsible to him, and we both conduct ourselves under his rules, under his dominion, in his presence. That's another thing to try to conduct yourself by the law without his presence and without his spirit. It's not possible. Scripture says that's the flesh. No man can even understand the scripture unless it's through and by the Holy Spirit. So our objectivity overall is to find the heart of the Holy Spirit. Let him show you where you are. You don't have to come and confess to me and you don't have to cry about it. You've already shed enough tears, right? You've already had enough pain. Our objectivity is to get into relational functionality with God through this study together with each other and make that our purpose. Is to, our purpose is to know God out of that. The boundary flow and everything flows out of that into our marriage, adding the sweetness that we need in our lives. Consider these things carefully. If you want to argue with yourself that your marriage is holy before God and you got some contract out there with the world, then tell yourself also that the homosexuals have a contract with God. Break yourself of that. Why do we need to do that? So that we can come in and make a covenant with God and a contract with him as husbands and wives. Jackie? Don't worry, I'm not going to talk for the next hour. So, <laughs> um, the, the Curtis and I've been have prayed a lot about this study and the order of it, and um, what all we we need to be um, looking at and and talking about in it. And 
this first week of homework that you have, and um, it, this is just the first week. This isn't all six weeks worth of homework. Darn. But it's just the first week, and so when you come back next week, we'll give you the next week's worth of homework and so forth and so on as, as we go along with this. But like I said, don't, maybe don't think of this as homework. It's just something you're going to be doing at home. Because if you think of it as homework, it's not going to be graded, and it, you don't even have to share anything with us or with the group because um, when we have discussions, because the, the layout of the, of the Bible study is going to be um, that when we come together normally, um, we'll spend the first um, hour to 45 minutes, um, the men discussing and the women discussing the, the week's worth of stuff, questions, comments, you know, all of that kind of stuff, sharing um, things and difficulties and triumphs and, and so forth. And then we'll come together and um, either Curtis will share or I will share or we'll both share and, uh, and talking about um, either giving more in-depth study and in what you did study or what you're going to be studying. And so tonight what we have thought we would have you do is if you look at that the first sheet in your notebook that had the where we were giving you opportunity to create keep notes on the turn the page over and on the second page on the, so it'll be on the back of that page you'll see um, some questions and then there's a, a blank space at the bottom that has um, where you're going to be writing a prayer and we want you to just um, in fact if we could um, just kind of as couples if y'all could find just a kind of a Pull, pull a couple of chairs together, maybe go um, even into the kids' room or other places. You can pull chairs over or in the office or, or wherever and just get together as a couple here in just a few minutes and go through that list and answer those questions and just take that honest assessment. Nobody, you're not going to be sharing this with anyone, um, so we don't need to know any of this, you know, how your marriage began or anything, but we just want you to come together and, and acknowledge, you know, did you, did you do it right? And if you did... Praise God. You know, make, make a new commitment to, to continue in that. You know, even the best marriages, even if you started off understanding what marriage was all about, which I bet most of us didn't because we had no model for that. You know, even, even in some Christian homes, we had no model of what marriage was supposed to be. And so, um, but but just go through that, and if you did happen to understand God's model when you came together, or if you have consecrated your marriage at some point um, to the Lord and 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 done that, um, then then just um, write that commitment that you had made on on that as that prayer at the bottom of the page. Um, just kind of get together. You can each write your own, or you can work on one together. Again, it's just going to be between y'all. But just get before the Lord as a couple and think about that the commitment that you're going to make for, the, it, for these next six weeks and for the rest of your lives together to have that your marriage consecrated before him. And um, Curtis and I are still praying, but we think that maybe at the end of the, of the um, Bible study time, we may even, um, you may even be writing new vows from now on about what your spiritual life together will look like because we didn't make those kind of vows. We kind of made vows of I'll love you and cherish you and sickness and health and good times and bad times and riches and poverty until death do us part sort of vows. But we don't even think about what is our spiritual life going to look like? And that's what this week's worth of homework you're going to be doing is, is looking at what your spiritual life should needs to look like together. You'll make discoveries of that yourself, what your goals are. There will be times that you'll do your homework individually, and then times we'll say, get together and go over this together. And it should be pretty clear in your homework. Now, Curtis and I are going blind from proofreading and rereading and, and, and editing and revising and, and all that kind of stuff. So if you find typos in this stuff, especially on these screens, because this tonight Curtis was just banging these out the last five minutes before we got here, and I was looking over his shoulder, you know, helping with the typing and stuff like that. And so um, so if you just have grace on us, because they're, you're probably going to find them. But also let us know, and that way we can just correct it in the 
in the, on the computer for any, any time in the future if anybody ever wants to do this again, unless we just burn it all and we're done. But um, so if y'all wouldn't mind, how about we break up? And, you know, this shouldn't take you too.